Hello everyone, my name is Chris. I'm the Student Ministries Pastor here at Agora Bio Fellowship. We are so excited that you have joined us for another online service. And just to let you know, our heart for everyone is to be connected to a local body of believers, a local church, and this online service is provided uh, just to be a supplement. So if you need some uh, extra time or you want some extra time in God's Word or you're unable to attend church due to work or vacation, whatever it may be, uh, that's why this service exists. Uh, just a supplement. Uh, with that said, there's a couple of things I just want to remind you of. The first thing is uh, we love praying for you throughout the week. You can text your confidential prayer request to 97000 uh, 97000 and Stephanie will receive those and she will respond back almost immediately. Uh, we love praying for you and uh, we want uh, to know that we love partnering with you in your uh, prayer. Uh, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about is... Uh, we have a lot going on here at Agora Bible Fellowship in all areas of ministries. And uh, you can go on our website at agorabible.org and you can find information about all of our life groups, our events and ministries that go on throughout the whole week. And that is our best, uh, that is the best place to find any of that information that you might be looking for. Lastly, we are just so thankful for your ongoing generosity and financial support and giving to our church. There's no way we can do what we do without that, and uh, we just so appreciate that. Uh, we just ask that you prayerfully consider making a donation, and you can do that on agorabible.org on our website under the Give tab, and you can donate there. We really appreciate that. Well, finally, let's get into God's Word, so grab that cup of coffee, grab that tea, and let's open up God's Word together. Thank you. Well, greetings, church family. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you for joining us online uh, this week in uh, Time in God's Word. And thank you for those that are so faithfully staying in this series, working through uh, 1 Corinthians. I want to do something a little bit different as we're starting this week. I just was uh, having just a, a nudge about this in just my, my quiet time this past week that I, I really think it's important before we get into God's Word to, to go to Him asking that he'll meet us in our study. And so I just wanted to ask you personally to just take a pause before we even start sharing, just to, just to spend a, a moment just quieting your heart, asking the Lord to, to, to meet you, to, to speak to you, whatever specific thing he wants to bring from this text to light, uh, that he would do that. And so I just want to just be uh, quiet just for just uh, five seconds, just a gift of time for you to be quiet, and then I'll pray. So let's go ahead and just do that just for a moment. Lord Jesus, we ask that you right now in this time in your word, that you talk to us, that you'd uh, bring this to life. Your, your word promises that it's living and active and, and uh, cuts straight to the morrow. And so we're asking that you do that, uh, that you'd speak to us, that you'd transform us. We don't want to remain the same. We want to be ever becoming more and more like you. So we ask now uh, that you'd meet us in this time, that this text would come to life, uh, we invite that in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, before we uh, get into this week's uh, text, I end up uh, quite a bit listening to different uh, sermons in the week. A lot of times, just even in preparation uh, for working through a text, I'll maybe listen to uh, five, six, even more sometimes of different sermons on the topic, just kind of gathering ideas. And uh, this last week, I was w listening to one that wasn't necessarily related, but the pastor proposed a question that I thought was really interesting. It really got me uh, thinking quite a bit in the past couple days, is why some people seem to be so radically transformed by the gospel, and then other people, it seems like they're not really changed that much at all. The more I was considering that and reflecting, I was like, man, that, that seems like there's something a little bit off. It seems like there, there's maybe a, a disconnect. Maybe someone doesn't fully understand the, the, the gospel and what it actually means for their life, that it's intentional transformation, that transformation is an expectation in our life. The pastor that I was sharing, he said he, his conclusion was that the outside world it, to them, the, the, the gospel isn't irrelevant. The outside world, more often than it being irrelevant, the gospel is lacking power. Because what the truth is, is people are, are hungry to see change. People are, are hungry to see transformation. 
So it's kind of neat, about a, a month ago, we had this idea just in a staff meeting, just talking through, man, it'd be fun to capture some different stories of transformation in our own church family. So we just put together and uh, worked with Michael Lubin, who does a lot of our, our video stuff, put together some different people and asked them if they'd be willing to share their story. And so just a, a couple weeks ago, we filmed this uh, video of Aaron Lacombe, who's one of our uh, church members, and uh, just hearing a little bit from his his life and seeing the, the transformation that God's been doing there. So fun just to see how God is at work. And so we're going to take the next four minutes to check out this video uh, about Aaron Lacombe's life. And just a little warning, it is a, a bit PG-13, but let's check out this somewhat raw story. I'm Aaron Lacombe. Uh, I started coming to ABF my last couple years of college in 2017 and 2018. And then I started coming back about a year ago and I've been following Jesus for about a year and a half now. So I grew up in a Christian household. From the time I was very young, I always wanted to be a professional athlete. It started off as basketball. And from about age 15, so once I got into high school, I started playing football. And then that's when my motivation kind of switched to start playing football and make that my new professional goal. I always wanted to make it professionally, not so much to be some big star famous person, but to just help my family out financially, um, being able to take care and provide for them. And so I put a lot of that on my shoulders. And so I was fortunate enough to play for the LA Rams right after college. I got signed and then about two weeks into training camp, got a little injury and that kind of took me out right away. My identity was being able to take care of my family and being an athlete and doing all these things. And so the second that was taken away, there was just a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. I didn't understand like what my purpose was. I was sitting in my car outside the training camp and I remember I just said, God, I don't know what your plan is. I'm not upset, I'm not mad at you, but like I do not know what's gonna happen next. And so through that two year period, he really took me just to a very, very low place and like kind of rock bottom just mentally on where I was at. Grew up in a Christian household and truly thought that I, I was a Christian because I just, that's all I really knew. It's what I was around. I went to schools that were Christian and I thought, you know, cause I was just a, a good kid in the, in the standards of the world that that's what made me Christian. And it wasn't until that I had to go through that moment of being injured and kind of having my, my life dream kind of taken away, that I was truly seeking, okay, what is it to be a Christian? I started dating a girl and at the very beginning of our relationship, like we were having premarital sex and I remember almost like a couple weeks into us dating, I just felt I can't say it's the voice of God, but I, I felt God pretty much saying, you can't, you can't be doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I was at uh, another church with my family. And so I'm wrestling with this issue on how do I, how do I like just fully surrender essentially? And there was a, a, a guest speaker at this church and he said, all of you young people that are having premarital sex with your boyfriend or girlfriend, it's like God's trying to bless your guys' relationship, but you're not allowing him to. Mm -hmm. And so something right there kind of clicked in that moment. And then right after that, the whole gospel kind of, kind of just clicked. One, God still loves me and he's calling on this for me to just kind of turn and repent and then just fully trust in him. Even if I don't understand it yet, I can't fully comprehend why, but just to trust that his plan is so much better than mine. Mm -hmm. And that even when I can't understand or see exactly what's going on, that I'm just gonna trust him. And so from that point, probably a couple weeks within that, it was last April, I just fully just kind of surrendered and said, all right, like I, I trust you. From that point, everything just started to change radically. I always went to church as a kid, more like when I had to, I was always doing sports. And then it became something where I was like, I wanna, I wanna go hear the word. Forgiveness and forgiveness of others. I was never one to just hold strong grudges, but I feel like that's still, there's people that we really don't like, or when they do something to us, we're like, okay, I don't need to get revenge, but like you're dead to me. And kind of that mindset really switched because I was like, wow, if God loved me so much and wanted to die for me and forgave me for all my sins against him, 
then what am I holding against anybody else? Coming to church and being excited about coming to church, wanting to serve, wanting to be in that community, it's completely flipped on where I never thought that's where I'd, where I'd want to be all the time and want to bring others in and just continue to keep building and, and growing the, the kingdom of God. I am so thankful that Jesus transformed my life. Man, so powerful just seeing what God's uh, doing and how he's working in Aaron's life. And next week, even at our Thanksgiving service, we're going to have the opportunity to see and hear from two more testimonies within our church community. And what I love is that these aren't stories of the good old days. These are stories of current transformation, the work that God's doing in people's lives now. See, last week, you might remember Chris Kerner as he was working through 1 Corinthians 8, he explained how God and God's upside down kingdom, we don't we're intended to voluntarily turn over our personal rights and liberties as an expression for, lo for the love of others. Kind of interesting because it's part of that transformation process is like, man, we don't do things the same way anymore. Now that we're a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, now that he's our king, all of a sudden we follow his example and his example is to elevate others over ourselves. So that was the, the outline of last week's text. And basically what you get the sense of this week that maybe there's a little bit of pushback. Maybe there's a little bit of pushback where the audience is asking Paul, well, do you do that yourselves? Do you do yourself? Do you practice what you actually preach? Kind of cool because you get the sense in this passage that Paul kind of rolls up his sleeves a little bit and says, all right, well, you want to hear what I do? Let me share with you an example of how I've put aside my personal rights in order to prioritize other people. You see, this was something that was a consuming drive of Paul's life as elevating the needs of others over himself. And so for us, as we're listening here today, it's going to be a contrast of what a lot of us are familiar with. Because truth is, if we're honest, deep down, our sin nature pulls us back to always pushing against anything that compromises my rights and what I believe is best for me. And so this is definitely a flip-flop in that kingdom. Let me just dive into chapter 9, verse 1 says this. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? This is Paul speaking. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. All right, we'll stop there. You might remember just a, a couple weeks ago, I talked about it was this idea of you're hearing one side of a phone conversation. You can't always pick up what's going on in the other side of the conversation. So we don't know exactly what's driving Paul to get into this, almost you sense like this defensive format that he's starting this conversation with. But it seems like even by his use of the word defense, which is kind of a, a term taken from their court system, that he's pushing back against some scrutiny against him. See, anybody that's in vocational ministry understands that we operate under the critic's spyglass. And so he's responding to that. He's pushing back and he's making a case for his apostleship. Probably some people were questioning whether or not he was a genuine apostle and what his authority would be over them. So he makes, he starts by explaining a few things with some rhetorical questions. Do you see him there in the text? He says, am I not free? Rhetorical question. The answer, yes. He has the same liberty as any Christ follower does to, to follow and be free and not be under the, uh, the hand of anyone else. So he starts with that. Then he says, am I not an apostle? Another rhetorical question. The answer, obviously, yes. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Again, yes. You see, an apostle, one of the defining things of what made someone a, an apostle is if they had spent time with the resurrected Jesus Christ. 
And as you know from Paul's story, he definitely had an encounter with Jesus Christ. So here he's kind of making it a roundabout way, kind of a, a, a rebuttal for anyone that has the attack that says, well, he's not a part of the original 12. He was not a part of the original 12, but he had an encounter with Jesus where he was sent. And really, his ministry in life was marked and completely different from that day forward. If you think about it, every single believer, every single follower of Jesus Christ, at some point in their life, they had an encounter that redirected their life. They had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed everything. On the door of our church, as you walk through the entrance, we have encounter, equip, extend, because we understand that, that that's where the journey begins. We try as best as we can at this church to set the table every time we gather, set the table for people to have an encounter with Jesus Christ when we spend time in his word, when we worship him through song. All of the things that happen on a Sunday morning are setting the stage for an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what changed the life of Paul, was that encounter. That's why he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? It's interesting if you see what he says next. He says, if to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. What, what does he mean by that? He's basically saying, I'm not concerned what outsiders say. I'm not concerned about the opinions of others. He said, but to you, to you, at least I am to you. In other words, uh, why, why would he be to them an apostle? He says, the, the, the reason is because they were a testimony to him being sent. Their very existence, their changed lives testified to God's working through Paul. They were, as it describes here, here the seal or confirmation of authenticity. Think about that, how often in our world we're looking to make sure something is real. If you've ever been burned by something that's fake, it pushes you back to ch double check and make sure something's authentic. I remember uh, quite a few years back being in, in China and they had so many different knockoff things, but everything was so expensive, inexpensive. You're just like, man, I want to buy this. I want to buy this. I remember getting back with this polo or Ralph Lauren shirt and getting it home and uh, thinking, man, I got such a great deal on it, but then finding out that it was missized by about three sizes and that you read on the, the labels upon closer review, you read upon it and you're just like, man, there's spelling errors in here and all kinds of faults. It was kind of a uh, fun discovery. The reason I bring that up and part of the reason that we're pointing to this idea that Paul accept, uh, amplifies is this picture of a seal, of something that's like authenticates it. You see, what's important is every single one of us, much like Paul, upon closer scrutiny, upon looking at, uh, up at the close at the, at the tag, someone should be able to see and be like, no, that's the real thing. That, that's genuine. That, that's, that's authentic. My uh, sister Kathleen got to share uh, for a, a long stretch teaching at the uh, different women's retreats that we do here at the church. And they just finished up uh, just a few weeks ago, walking through the fruits of the spirit. When you're talking about, because you hear that question, well, are you authentic? One of the things is a good test as to our authenticity is just looking at even the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Basically, those are intended to be increasing in measure in the life of every single believer. So in the same way that Paul's putting himself out there to be uh, tested, to be scrutinized, the, the believer, present day, every single one of us, someone should be able to look at us and be able to identify even those growing characteristics in our life. I'll read them again. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Would those be descriptors of you? He continues in the text, kind of explaining his rights. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? 
Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Now, reading that, you might be like, well, what, what are we talking about here? Basically, Paul is doing ministry in a season or during a time period where there is really heavy religious entitlement. Basically, the religious leaders of that time were at the very top of the social class. It wasn't like us where we have politics as one uh, arena in life and entertainment's another, and we have different arenas that we elevate differently. In that time period, it was just religious leaders. It was merged all into one. And as we see in the gospel accounts, Jesus rebuked those religious leaders. And one of the primary rebukes was because of their misuse of their position, their misuse of their rights. Now, Paul, uh, in contrast, explains how even as a, a commissioned apostle, he had a variety of rights that he voluntarily released. Do you see what those rights are that he mentions? He lists them right there in the text. The first one he mentions, right? The right to eat and drink. Now, in this context, he's not just saying the right to have a meal. He's saying in this context, refers to the right to have his material needs met at the church's expense. He's saying, hey, I have that right that I'm not taking advantage of. Then he refers to the right to marry a believing wife. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, Paul's choice to choose a life of singleness, understanding what marriage brings and some of the restrictions that that might call. It's interesting even just thinking about that, though, because he's talking about a right, and then he refers to other, uh, the other disciples who were married and were ministering. It's kind of interesting because he makes reference to Jesus' brothers. Most likely in the brothers mix would have been James. Then he mentions Cephas, which is another name for Peter, which is kind of ironic when you think of other church faith traditions that point to this idea that, the, that someone in uh, leadership can't be married. But at the same time, they list Paul, that, that, that they list Peter as the, the primary and first, uh, the first pope. It's kind of interesting within the Roman Catholic Church, but we see here that he was married with a family. So it's kind of interesting. So the idea of mandatory celibacy in ministry is kind of thrown out the window, which is good news for me personally. So then he mentions another right, says the right to refrain from outside work. Basically saying, similar to the first right, basically saying that he could be financially supported by the church so that he didn't have to do additional work. We know from other places in scripture that Paul was very intentional about this, that he was a tent maker, literally making tents. That's where we get the expression, in order and repairing tents, most believe, in order to provide financially so that he didn't have to lean into the churches that he was starting. So he lists a number of other arenas in life where workers are supported for their work. He mentions a soldier is provided for. The, a farmer or a vineyard a keeper is provided for from their vineyard. A, a shepherd is provided milk from the sheep that he cares for. Basically, this is the, the idea saying that he's saying in these, all these arenas, that's just a natural thing. But here in each of those different areas, he's saying you might have the right to that. But as a minister, he's saying, I'm choosing not to partake. So when they're asking the question of Paul, are you just telling us to, to lay aside our rights? Are you, just, are you just speaking this without living out yourself? Paul's like, no, I'm pretty much doing it in an extreme fashion, even in my own life. Such a contradiction from what we're familiar with, especially as an American, because as an American, one of the things that we so cherish and fight for is our rights. And here's the confusing intention that we run into is because reality says when we embrace Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're first a follower of Jesus and then second or third or wherever it would be on the list, an American. And here's the reality of someone that's called to be a follower of Jesus Christ is you're not called to always demand your rights. You're often called, you're often called 
to yield your rights. That's where there's the tension. And, that, and that's one of the things that I want to make sure we're clear on. That's not, I'm not saying that we have to lay over on our back and be a, a, a doormat for everybody. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to operate with a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit as to when there's times that he calls us to be able to stand up for rights and when he actually calls us to lay down our rights. You see, in the, these examples that he uses in this section, he says, well, some of these guys are married and doing ministry. That's great for me personally. I feel called and tugged towards waiving those rights. You see, each one, I imagine, is being led by the Holy Spirit. And that's an important thing for each of us to realize. We'll continue in the text. It says in verse 8, It says, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you should not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritually things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? All right, so what is Paul saying there? Saying basically, he says, I'm not just expressing human opinion here. He's pointing, he's mentioned to scripture that's brought up these things all the way back as a foundation back in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25, verse four, which highlights the expectation that for the ox to be able to eat some of the grain as he's treading it. Basically what that was utilized for is the ox would step on the grain to release the, the edible part and break and kind of separate the two is kind of a process. But in that process, they never restricted the ox from being able to partake, to be able to eat from what he was doing his work. But it's interesting because Paul points out, he said, I'm pretty sure that that rule wasn't put in place with the ox's ox's welfare in mind. Instead, he's wanting to make sure that it translates to people, a principle that's carried, a principle that carries over. If you've put in the work It's not an odd thing for you to expect to be able to take from that work. It's a common practice in animals, also in other arenas of life. He mentions that with the the thresher and the the, the plowman having an expectation after the work that they've put into farming that they receive from that. We believe as a a church here, and this is interesting to talk about as a pastor, I believe it's a a biblical uh, precedent that's set up here that there's a basis for paying vocational ministers for the work that they do. That's not uh, something that we came up with outside of scripture. It's something that God put in place and designed from the, uh, from the be- very beginning. It was an expectation. And so our church, I'm super thankful for, has made that a priority over, over the years for a number of us to be able to give the, pr- the majority of our day or the prime hours of our day towards ministering, towards caring, towards digging into the word, towards prepping and studying even for this conversation we're having now. And they've, used, they've been very diligent with that. Our elders coming up with and establishing salaries that are based on kind of national averages and then looking at kind of cost of living in this area. They've done the work and it's not something that's weird or odd or that we came up with. It's a biblical precedent all the way back in the Old Testament. Think about that. I'm so thankful for uh, an elder board that's kind of laid the groundwork for that and grateful for the faithfulness of those who give that allow for that. But here he's making the case that this is something that was put in place. It's put in practice all the way back in the Old Testament. It says, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much that we reap material things from you? Continuing in the text, Verse 12 says, if others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? 
and that those who serve in the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. All right, we'll stop there for a little more explanation. It seems like, man, he's just, he's just uh, getting further and further into this conversation. And, and here's the important thing. For us to not get lost in the weeds of what he's saying here and miss the big idea that he's trying to instill in the audience that he's writing to. So he says out of the gates, if others, and we're not sure about the others that are receiving uh, financial gain for this, who he's referring to, it doesn't point specifically, but he's just saying that it's not uncommon for somebody to receive income because of their spiritual care over a group. He says, but he says what's important that I wanted you to see here. He says, we have not made use of this right. Paul has opted not to be paid from the churches that he started. Why is that? Well, we see it right there in the text. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Basically, he didn't want any reason for it to get polluted, where people are thinking he has a mixed agenda in coming to them. He's explaining, hey, this, I don't, I don't want anything to cause you to think that there's a wrong agenda behind the scenes here. So reading a little background, even on this section here, and I, to my understanding during that time period, they had different philosophers because there's a, uh, a time where they really elevated th uh, great thinkers. And so they had philosophers that would show up in towns and charge for them to be able to teach them new philosophies and new ways of thinking. And he's like, man, I don't want to be muddled in with that group. I don't want to be seen as somebody that's just trying to take advantage of the message. And so that's why he's saying, I, 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 I've waived all of those rights. And to us, it might not seem like that big of a deal. But if you actually think about it, if someone is holding the gospel up so dearly with such priority that they're saying, I'm going to waive all all of my rights for income. I'm going to go the extra mile and work doubly hard just in order to protect the integrity of the gospel. Man, there must be something really important with this gospel message. If it's something that's held so precious, that's held so dear, thinking about that as it relates to the gospel and how we choose to elevate it or not elevate it. I was listening to another pastor that was talking about this topic and he was asking the question, man, a, a good litmus test to how high of regard you hold, hold the gospel is whether or not you're even able to articulate the gospel. Question for you, just as you're listening here today, do you feel a confidence that you could sit down with somebody, explain to them. If they ask you, well, what is the gospel? Could you explain it? I would say that there's a concern if not. You see, the awesome thing about the gospel message is, it's the, in, is in its simplicity. It's something that can be off, was authenticated by many witnesses that, that actually can validate what happened. God, Almighty God, made the choice to come down in the form of a baby, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, came down to this earth in the form of a baby. His name was Jesus the Christ. He lived the perfect life as an example for us. And then, hopefully we're familiar with this, died on a cruel Roman cross as a substitute for us. He, he literally took our place, what was intended for us because of our sin, because of our mistakes, because of our rebellion. He took that on himself, died on a cruel cross, and then rose again, providing victory over death on the third day, leaving every single person on this planet, really with one big decision. What do I do with that free gift? Do I accept it? Or do I reject it? And our eternity hinges on what our choice is. We can either spend an eternity with him or separated from him in torment based on that decision. That, my friends, is the gospel message. That's the gospel message. In a nutshell, every single one of us, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, should be able to clearly explain that 
to somebody because it's such a priority. That's why Paul's saying, man, I'll go through anything. I'll, he literally says, I'll endure anything rather than jeopardize the gospel. He refers to people there continuing the conversation about employment. He talks about those that are employed by the, the temple, the Levites who worked full time tending the tabern tabernacle. They were supported by tithes and offerings. You're probably familiar with that. Also, Paul refer, he also refers to the Lord speaking on this subject. You can really only point to one time mentioning it in Luke chapter 10, verse 7 where he describes as he's sending out the disciples, he describes that the workman is worthy of their wages, that there's an expectation if you're ministering to have your specific needs met. So, but the big idea here is the integrity of the gospel, a willingness to say, I'll waive my rights because that is so precious to me. Continues with that idea in this last couple verses. We'll conclude on verse 18, starting on verse 15. It says, But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusting with, entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? And here he explains that in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge. So as to make full use of my right in the gospel. All right, let's talk through what he's saying here. Paul's just given in this whole section a, a plethora of reasons he had for his right to be financially supported by those he's ministering to. We don't know what compelled this conversation. It kind of feels at times like you're like, okay, Paul, you're kind of belaboring the point here. But he explains here that he hasn't leaned into this right, not making a, he's not trying to make a roundabout case, trying to convince them to start supporting them. He's clear on that. He says pretty dramatic things here. He says, I would rather die than take away my ground for boasting. Now, when you first read that, you're just like, well, what, do you, what does he mean, take away my ground for boasting? I think it's important to dig into what that actual word means. Basically, the, the word here is not talking about pride or boasting. Or it says, What he's saying is he's saying, don't take away my basis or, or reason or source of joy. Don't take that away from me. It's like that, that's the, the main thing that I live for. It's the, it's the thing that I love more than anything else. He's compelled by delight, not duty. He's saying, don't take away, it's, the, it's like the, the coffee person that's saying, don't take away my morning Starbucks, only amplified a million percent. He's saying, don't take away my, my reason for living. Don't, don't take away that. He said, I would rather die than have that. The reason I lay down all my rights is the joy that's found in sharing the gospel. He explains that it's a, a privilege. It's not a bragging, right? Because look what he says next. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. He's like, he's like I'm not bragging about that. I'm not finding joy in that, in, in that I had something to do with that. But he's saying instead, he explains that his, he has a calling that, he, he can't be, that can't be ignored in his life. He says, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He's saying, man, I can't not do it. It's such a part of who I am. It would be impossible for me to shut up because I've seen the, tr I've seen the other side. I've seen the transformation that comes because of it. Notice he explains, and this is the important part that I want to leave you with, explains the reward. What actually is the reward? He says in verse 18, what then is my reward? And then he explains that in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge. I love that. He's like, he's like, I've tasted and seen this and I care about other people so deeply. I want them to be able to have it and get it for nothing, 
for completely free. It's kind of interesting to watch the, this trend of giving away free stuff online. There's a, a guy by the name of Mr. Beast that does all kinds of different uh, things out there on the internet. And then it's kind of gotten a, a big uh, uh, following of people like, well, what's he going to give away next? I remember watching uh, one episode where he bought a car dealership and all the cars that were there. And then he started putting listings on the door for like $3. And whoever stopped in got one of those cars for like two or three dollars. There's something that comes in the principle that's in scripture that's more blessed to give than receive. And I think there's something to that as Paul understands what a big thing he has to be able to offer. He's like, man, I've got this gospel thing. And he realizes after experiencing it, he says, don't, don't take that away from me. Don't take, I'd rather not live. I'd rather put me to death rather than giving that opportunity away. Philippians 3, 8, he says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. See, Paul's holding up his life as an example for us to follow. An example that the world is so hungry for. An example of someone that's willing to give up their rights. Somebody that's been completely transformed, 180 degree turn. That's what the world is starved for. And that, my friends, is what we're longing for, whether we realize it or not. We're longing for that level of commitment and transformation, even in our own lives. Let me pray as I wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this chance to spend some time in your word. And at the beginning of this time, we asked you to speak to us. And I ask that you've done that. I ask that you've moved in hearts, that you've encouraged people, you've challenged people, you've met them exactly where they're at, God. We ask now that we would walk away, that we'd be changed, that we'd be different, that we'd be more like you because of time spent in your word. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, thank you again so much for being with us online. I wanted to ask a three, maybe four minute favor for us before you go away today. Uh, just as something going on in our church that I just wanted to highlight is just a, a possibility for participation, but I, obviously absolutely no pressure to do that. We do something every single year at ABF at the end of the year. We have a couple year end projects that we try to tackle uh, just after we've met the kind of financial expectations of the, of the year's budget. I just wanted to mention it just solely, not because it's connected to this message in any way, but it's the time of the year that we start talking about it. So this year we listed three different opportunities for us to give above and beyond our annual budget. And one of them, the first one, is to help basically 10% of all of everything that's given to our church goes towards uh, missions, global and local. The majority of that's towards different global missionaries. Well, we've built up over the years an expectation of this fund that we use to be able to bless the different, mi uh, the different missionaries that we support. So if they have a specific need, we kind of look across the landscape of the different needs and each month we provide uh, a support towards one of those specific needs with one of our missionaries. Missionaries. And so we have a fund for that and we wanted to kind of rebuild that. So it's not a huge amount that we're trying to rebuild. We have other funds that are being added to that, but we're looking just to add $5,000 towards that uh, account to be able to help with different missions projects. Examples of those in the last year uh, was maybe an example of the, the Irelands that helped work with street orphans and they needed some additional resources for some of their needs. We were able to help with that one particular uh, month. Another month we were helping uh, with CHIP and the, uh, providing for Ukrainian refugees. That would have been another project. And so that's one of the things that is an example of one of our three year-end projects. The second one is kind of somewhat related, but more uh, here in local ministry. We have what we call a deacon's fund. I know it's kind of an old school term, but the idea is this, is we have a, a fund that we put money into so that as we are alerted of needs within our own community and within our own church, we're able to help meet some of those needs. 
Basically, we have an example of that as we have if somebody stops in as a drop into the church that's going through a difficult time. We might have a gas card or we might have a, a grocery uh, gift card that we're able to help out with. For somebody that's maybe in our church that's maybe has a, a, a difficult time uh, making rent that month or maybe a scholarship needed for a WANA or one of our camps or, or maybe a car repair. There's just a whole plethora of different needs that arise. And it seems like those have been amplified in the last couple couple years. And so we like to be able to keep that fund so it's at a spot where we can really just be known for being generous and blessing and caring for our next door neighbors. And so that fund, we're trying to raise $15,000. So between those two funds, at the end of this year's expenses, we're hoping to raise $20,000 towards that. And then above and beyond that, we're realizing it's kind of neat as we're assessing where we're at as a church, as far as church growth and what God's doing here. It's kind of cool because we're celebrating just as an elder board the last couple of months, we we're looking at attendance patterns and we're actually larger than we were before COVID, which is strange because most churches definitely uh, are not able to celebrate that. So we're thanking the Lord for what he's done and how he's been faithful to this ministry. But there's starting, our wheels are starting to turn. Well, what would it look like in the next couple years if God chose to bless this church with another 30, 50, 100 people. If you're here on a Sunday, you realize, man, well, where would you put an extra 50 people? So we're starting to think through and look at potentials of expansion and what that would look like as a church. And so any remainder of additional funds going towards this year-end project would just be starting to explore that and building kind of a, I'd call it a nest egg towards uh, future expansion if God so chooses uh, to bless this church. So those are three different things as opportunities towards year and giving. And some of you might just be like, man, I'm just online. Man, if you're just a guest with us, there is zero obligation. But our ask for anyone that's maybe a regular, that's blessed by our ministry, is that you at least make this a spiritual exercise and just pray through what your part might be towards supporting the ministry here at Agora Bible Fellowship. That's the one ask that we have is at least that you'd pray about it, seek the Lord and see if he nudges you towards uh, something as related to giving. Thanks so much for giving me a couple extra minutes. God bless you. Have an amazing day.